Good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Leibowitz. My wife, Jessica, and I want to welcome all of you to Brandeis, and thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, we're pleased to celebrate a special colleague appointed to a newly established endowed chair. We celebrate Professor Shai Feldman as the inaugural holder of the Raymond Frankel Endowed Chair for Israeli Politics and Society at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. The Frankel Chair was created last year to support a distinguished faculty member whose expertise involves issues related to the state of Israel, its place in the Middle East, and its relationship to the broader region. Shai is the perfect choice to be the first person honored with this appointment. A longtime member of the Brandeis community, he was founding director of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. We are confident that Shai will continue to carry on and enhance the university's reputation as a leader in understanding Israel, an essential source that can help U.S. policymakers gain insight into the complex issues related to Israel and its role in the Middle East and on the world stage. Once again, let's offer our congratulations to Shai. We also want this evening to honor the family foundation that created this professorship. We're delighted that Belinda Frankel is here with us tonight. Belinda is president of the Raymond Frankel Foundation, which was established by her late father, Raymond Frankel, four decades ago. The Frankel Foundation has been deeply committed to Jewish causes and it has been an outstanding supporter of Brandeis. I'm very grateful for the Foundation's visionary support of the work of the Crown Center, especially the Crown Center's interaction with the policy community in Washington, D.C. With Frankel Foundation support, the Crown Center and the Brookings Institution run a joint program for our scholars to provide briefings for mid-career po policy professionals working in Congress and the executive branch. The Foundation's generous philanthropy will make sure that the Crown Center continues as a leader in the field and strengthens the Center's exploration of Israeli politics and society. I will share more about the Frankel family's history and engagement with Brandeis later on this evening. Alan Meyer is also with us tonight. Alan is a director of the Frankel Foundation and has been instrumental in establishing the professorship we highlight this evening, along with many other academic collaborations with Brandeis and other universities. Alan serves on the Crown Center's advisory board as well. I also welcome this evening some special guests. Jeanette Lehrman Neubauer, class of 1969, who is a former Brandeis trustee, and her husband, Joseph Neubauer. They have been longtime supporters of the Crown Center, especially for the postdoctoral fellowship program at the center. In addition, Stephen Van Evera has come from MIT this evening to celebrate his good friend, Shai Feldman. Professor Van Evera is Ford International Professor in MIT's Political Science Department. And also here this evening, Provost Carol Ferke, Jonathan Sonner, University Professor, and John Levison, Director of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education and Chair of our Near Eastern and Judaic Studies Program. And I welcome all the Brandeis faculty members, administrators, students and staff, and other audience members who are here with us this evening to celebrate. But I'd like now to welcome Gary Seymour up to the podium. Gary is the Crown Family Director of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies and also Professor of the Practice of Politics. Gary will formally introduce Shai. Gary. <clears throat> Thank you very much, President Leibowitz. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. I want to give a special thanks to um, our friends Belinda Frankel and Alan Meyer, uh, who've made this chair possible. Now, I have the very pleasant task of introducing my good friend and colleague, uh, Shai Feldman, as the first incumbent of the Raymond Frankel Endowed Professorship for Israeli Politics and Society. Shai is a renowned scholar of politics, national security, and peacemaking in the Middle East. He's the author of six books, ranging from Israeli nuclear strategy to U.S.-Israeli strategic partnerships to Middle East arms control talks to efforts to promote peace and security in the region. And in that regard, I want to specifically recommend his most recent publication, 
Arabs and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East, which is now in its second edition. This book is the first ever academic textbook on the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, co-authored by an Israeli, a Palestinian, and an Egyptian. And the book has won praise for presenting multiple perspectives and competing narratives in a fair and unbiased manner. In a field of study that is always complex and usually contentious, Professor Feldman has set the bar for clear-headed and clear-eyed research in accordance with the highest academic standards. But beyond his scholarship, Shai is also a builder of institutions. Shortly after he received his PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley, where I think he probably met his friend Stephen Everett, he, Shai, joined the, uh, what was then the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University. Eventually, he rose to head that center from 1997 to 2005. And under Shai's leadership, the Jaffe Center, now known as the Institute for National Security Studies, became the preeminent think tank in Israel for the study of national security and defense. Not content to create only one center of excellence in his lifetime, Shai arrived here at Brandeis in 2005 as the founding director of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. As director from 2005 to 2019, Shai established the Crown Center as a world-class hub for Middle East studies, teaching, and mentorship by recruiting some of the most respected and knowledgeable scholars from throughout the region to produce balanced <clears throat> and dispassionate interdisciplinary research on the modern Middle East including the 22 countries of the Arab League, uh, Israel, Turkey, and Iran. <clears throat> One of the things that makes the Crown Center unique is that it spans all the countries of the region and tries to look uh, at the region from an integrated standpoint. The goal that Shai set at the center was to produce policy-relevant research not to advocate particular policies, but to produce knowledge that would help government policymakers be better informed and make better decisions about the region. As Shai likes to remind us, theory and practice are not the same thing. In Shai's office, he has a framed quote from that great American philosopher, Yogi Berra. And the quote says, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Whenever I come to visit Shai in his office and talk about what's going on in the Middle East, I always look at that framed quote that he has. From 2019 until 2022, Shai was on leave from Brandeis University to serve as president of Sapir Academic College in Israel, situated just two miles from the Gaza Strip. We are all very fortunate that Shai chose to return to Brandeis last fall to continue his teaching <clears throat> and his research. As the current director of the Crown Center, I'm very fortunate that Shai is once again back at the center as we try to live up to the reputation he established for balanced and dispassionate policy relevant research. Speaking of which, I hope you'll all check out the new Crown Center podcast series, which is on our website, the latest vehicle for, uh, for putting forward our studies and research. And finally, we are extremely grateful to the Frankel Foundation for establishing a chair that will ensure that the study of Israeli politics and society and Israel's relations with other countries in the region will remain an integral element in the Crown Center mission. Shai's experience, his temperament, his intellect, and his wisdom make him an ideal inaugural occupant of the Raymond Frankel Endowed Professorship 
for Israeli politics and society. So with that pleasant duty, uh, having been taken care of, Shai, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you at the podium for your very timely lecture. Well, that's a lot to live up to. Um, in any case, I'm really uh, not only honored, but really excited to, uh, uh, to have this celebration uh, of the Raymond uh, Frankel Chair in Israeli Politics and uh, Security and Society. <clears throat> and I, I'm not going to go through all the thank yous, um, but I, would, I do wish to thank uh, Belinda Frankel, uh, Ray Frankel's daughter, uh, and Alan Meyer uh, of, the, of the Frankel Foundation for making this possible. Uh, I, I'm truly honored to be the, the first recipient of um, the first recipient uh, of, of this chair. My only regret, actually, is that I got to know um, Raymond Frankel uh, too late uh, for, for my taste uh, in his in his uh, in his amazing. Uh, in his amazing life. Um, the amazing things that he did during his lifetime, uh, including, and I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about this um, over dinner, um, his role um, in actually helping, uh, being involved in a team that helped um, create the state uh, of Israel. Um, and of course, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Professor Leonowitz and, uh, and, and Gary for their warm words um, and their decision to offer me uh, the position of the first recipient. Um, and I'd also like to pay tribute to two individuals who unfortunately couldn't be uh, with us today. Um, uh, one is Lester Crown uh, and the other is former President Yehuda Reinhardt. Uh, without their vision, uh, the Crown Center would not have been created and uh, Frankly, I wouldn't be here uh, today. Um, <clears throat> now, I also want to compliment um, President Leibovitz for his judgment about timing. He, he I have to say, uh, is, this is just nothing short of genius. Um, because in any class taught on the subject of Israeli politics and security and society, the past 14 weeks will be noted as a major milestone. PhD dissertations and books will be written about this period. Indeed, so much has happened in Israel in the last 72 hours since the firing, the sort of firing, which is not exactly sure that it was a firing uh, of the defense minister um, that sent hundreds of thousands of Israelis to the streets. Um, in fact, that night until 2 in the morning, um, finally, actually compelling the Prime Minister of Israel to retreat. Um, still, um, Israel remains uh, at the epicenter of this, what I call, the perfect storm. In fact, in the last 72 hours, I thought maybe I'll change the title to a tsunami. Um, now, uh, as I titled this at 75, uh, uh, Israel, a miracle in a perfect storm. Uh, and that is because, um, and we have to really grasp before we delve into the last 14 weeks and two, three days, uh, to really appreciate the extent of the miracle uh, that Israel is. And uh, I, would, I was thinking that uh, sometimes I have to share with you, I fantasize that if Ben-Gurion uh, came up from his grave in Stebokel, and I would have been chosen to be the lucky one to brief him on what happened to this thing that he established on May 15, 1948, uh, I would say my wild guess is that even Ben-Gurion, who was really a pessimist, would have said, for only 75 years, not bad. So what are, what are the making of this miracle? First of all, 
on the economic, the economic miracle, Israel's uh, GDP, gross domestic product, already in 2021 reached $488 billion, which was, I'll say this slowly, 1,860% increase, 1,860% 1, increase since 1980. France uh, grew during the same period by 246%, Germany by 361%. Per capita income, Israel in, uh, the Israeli average Israeli in 2021 reached $52,151, to be precise, according to whatever. And that's a 720% increase since 1980. Israel's GDP per capita actually is larger than uh, Germany's and France. The startup nation, well, you've read books about that already, innovations measured in patents registered. In 2021, Israelis registered twice as many patents per 1 million people than France. 1,851 versus 1,111, uh, 10, uh, 1,011. Israeli companies are now, lots of them are listed in the US stock markets. Uh, uh, 107, precisely 107 Israeli companies are now registered in NASDAQ. Israel, as you know, is a highly advanced military industrial complex, massive arms deals just with India, which is now Israel's largest customer. Uh, and the latest is a multi-billion dollar deal to sell the most advanced anti-missile system of all, pe of all armies <laughs> to the Germans. And finally, the ultimate economic uh, miracle is the natural gas findings um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, making Israel now energy or on its way to become energy independent. That's all of this is just in the realm of economics. In the realm of uh, education and, and, and the fact that Israel is a highly uh, advanced technological society, well, the UN has something called the HDI, Human and Development Index, that includes uh, university degrees per capita and other indices. In 2021, Israel was ranked 22 uh, uh, with a score of 0 0.919, whatever that means. Uh, France was ranked 28 with a score of whatever, <laughs> six notches below Israel. Oh, right, with a score of 0 0.903. Israel, uh, on the peace realm, Israel uh, now has uh, peace with Egypt and Jordan that lasted 44 and 29 years, respectively. In 2002, the same Arab League that made the decision in 1948 to invade Palestine to prevent the Jewish state from coming about, uh, adopted the so-called Arab Peace Initiative that basically told Israel, under these and these conditions, we are willing not only to sign agreements with you, but to embrace you uh, into the Middle East. And now in 2020, with the Abraham Accords, four additional countries in the Arab world, Bahrain, the Emirates, Morocco, and Sudan, signed peace and normalization agreements with Israel. And now Israel also enjoyed, enjoys uh, close but undeclared uh, relations with Saudi Arabia and Oman. In addition, Israel is now party to something called the Eastern Mediterranean Energy Coalition, which brings together uh, Israel and Egypt and Greece and Cyprus and Jordan. The most uh, recent breakthrough in this realm is actually the Israeli-Lebanese agreement that was brokered uh, just a few months ago, um, delineating the economic boundaries between the two countries, allowing both countries to exploit the natural gas fields of the Eastern Mediterranean. The reason why this is a breakthrough is because there is no such thing as an agreement with Lebanon. This is de facto an agreement with Hezbollah because, there is, because there is, the Lebanese government cannot sign today anything without Hezbollah's approval. There is extensive defense cooperation between Israel with its, some of its neighbors, with Jordan, uh, coordinating the fighting uh, against ISIS and everything related to the southern part of Syria. 
with Egypt regarding terrorism in the Sinai, with Abu Dhabi, the installation of an Israeli state-of-the-art anti-rocket system in, in Abu Dhabi after the Houthi cruise missile attacks against the Aramco installations in Saudi Arabia. With Bahrain, there is also a closer relationship, close relationship between the Israeli and the Bahraini uh, navies um, and air forces. And finally, with Morocco, a whole series of defense cooperation agreements were signed in the last few months. U.S.-Israeli relations, there are people in this audience that know more about this than I do. I'll just say, especially since 1979, when the U.S. Congress declared Israel a major non-NATO ally, and President Re under President Reagan, a whole sign, uh, an array of uh, memorandums of understanding and memorandums of agreements uh, were signed in the realm of strategic cooperation between the two countries. Uh, in 1991, you had the first actual stationing of American troops in Israel, in Israel's defense during the first, uh, the first Gulf War. And even during Obama, the Obama administration, a major uh, uh, leap forward when the first time the two countries, according to foreign sources, um, actually conducted foreign uh, complete uh, operations uh, together, mostly in the realm of cyber, the, f the famous stuck next or whatever. Um, attack on the Iranian uh, nuclear reactors. Um, during um, the Trump-Biden administrations, Israel, as you know, mo was moved from UCOM, from the European Command to CENTCOM to the Central Command, which actually puts Israel now and the Arab countries in one uh, same framework, same umbrella in U.S. defense thinking and defense uh, planning. Not, not less miraculous, and for me personally, not less important, uh, is what's happened in the Israeli cultural scene. It's exploding. What's going on every single week in Israel, um, the Friday supplement of Haaretz is thicker than the Friday cultural supplement of the New York Times. Music uh, and theater as of the 1930s when Russian, um, when the first wave of musicians purged in Nazi Germany came to Palestine. Now, in the early 90s, the Russian the immigration of Russian Jews uh, to Israel produced three symphony orchestras. Um, and of course, the scene of film and video uh, are also uh, exploding in Israel. Some of you see these, the results of these in Netflix and Amazon Prime or whatever. Now, cultural for me, is an important dimension of the quality of quality of life. So look at what happened with life expectancy in Israel. The US life expectancy is 76.4 years. In the UK, 81.6. In France, 83. In Israel, 83.3. And finally, and I think, I think to, today, or as of a few hours ago, I can say Israel is still the only democracy in the Middle East. Possibly the biggest miracle, the biggest miracle because practically none of Israel's founding parents, let's call it this way, Golda Meir spent a few years in Milwaukee, um, Chaim Weizmann spent quite a few years in England. Everybody else among the leaders of the Zionist movement came from countries with no history uh, in democracy. Um, so, to me, this is the biggest uh, uh, miracle of all. Now the miracle, as I said, finds itself in the epicenter of the perfect storm. During the past 14 weeks, uh, as you know, Israel experienced mass protests, the likes of which we have actually never seen before. Um, a quarter of a million, Saturday after Saturday evening, is given the population ratios between Israel and the United States is equivalent to eight and a half million people. Who are they? A coalition of many, many civil society groups. Some of them didn't even exist until 12 weeks ago. Uh, leaders of, uh, and, and they are pillars of the Israeli elite. Leaders of Israel's financial community and industrial sector, physicians, lawyers, judges, startup nations, high-techers, 
uh, and of course the, uh, the Israeli Armed Forces Reservists, veterans of the Air Force, the Navy, Israel's Special Forces, as well as the Mossad and the Shabak. What are these hundreds of thousands of people protesting? What makes this a perfect storm? What makes it a perfect storm is essentially an, an accumulation of six different issues. One is the judiciary revolution, reform according to the government, uh, that seeks essentially to redistribute power between Israel's judiciary and its legislative and executive branches. Primarily in three ways. One, by changing the process of, of, of nominating judges, by giving politicians a much greater role uh, than before. Um, number two, by curtailing the power of the Supreme Court to strike down laws by, that were passed by the Knesset. Uh, currently, the, security, the uh, Supreme Court can strike down a Knesset law if it judges that it contradicts one of Israel's basic laws. Viewing themselves as representing, quote, the will of the people, the proponents of the reform view such Supreme Court strike downs as distorting the will of the people. The third component of the reform is the proposed elimination of the judge's liberty to rule what constitutes reasonable conduct. In a nutshell, the story is this. In the absence of a constitution, which Israel does not have, and especially in, case, in cases where there is no real, real precedent, the Supreme Court took upon itself to judge whether government officials' behavior or conduct should be regarded as reasonable or not. The proposed new legislation will deprive the Supreme Court from its liberty to issue such rulings, that is to say, based on their judgments of reasonableness. These three facets of the reform, or overall, are just three facets. There are, in addition to that, a um, a tsunami of, of uh, legislative proposals that basically all legalize corruption. From allowing the leader of Shas to serve as a minister in the government despite having been three twice indicted and convicted of corruption, to allowing elect elected officials to, and this passed today, allow, a law that allows officials to receive gifts to fund their legal and medical expenses. And you can issue or utter a wild guess who exactly this law is supposed to address. The second dimension of the, of, the, of the perfect storm is an attempt to violate one of the basic principles that were stipulated in 1948 uh, by the new uh, Jewish state's founding father, David Ben-Gurion. It was called, translation from Hebrew to English, the unity of command, stipulating that the state must possess monopoly of force. That, that is, that there will be one government, there will be one army, there will be one police force. So important was this uh, concept for Ben-Gurion, so truly was he convinced that the alternative to this is complete anarchy, that in the state's early days, when it had, it had few arms and very little ammunition to defend itself from the invading Arab forces, Ben-Gurion still gave the order to sink a ship called the Altalena that in his view comprised, uh, to, that was carrying arms and ammunition to the Etzel, which in his, Ben-Gurion's view, comprised a militia that at that point um, still resisted uh, merging into the defense forces of the embryonic new state. Now, 75 years later, the new Israeli government coalition agreement gives uh, a larger role to two right-wing extremist leaders, Bezalel Smotrich and ben Itamar Benkvil, roles and responsibilities over powerful administrative bodies and law enforcement agencies, primarily the Border Patrol and the coordinator of government operations in the West Bank. These bodies, which were under the sole command of the defense minister and the chief of staff of the IDF, have been placed instead under the partial control of these extremist leaders. The combination 
of these individuals' control over these bodies with their extremist views is nothing but toxic. It allows them to inflame the, the Palestinian-Israeli relations by pushing policies that encourage violence and by discouraging Israel's security bodies, especially the police, to stabilize, calm, and avoid escalation in these relations. The third issue comprising the perfect storm is the recent escalation and, uh, and deterioration in Israeli-Palestinian relations. Not only accelerating the, like, the, the, the likely slide towards a one-state uh, one solution or one-state reality, um, but also threatening the sustainability of the Abraham Accords uh, because of this slide. This slide is not entirely new. It's been brewing through the tenure of a number of Israeli governments. Khalil Shikaki and I wrote a Crown Center Middle East brief a few, quite a few years ago um, about uh, this slide. Um, and the causes for it are located as much on the Palestinian side than on the Israeli side. With the diminishing credibility of the Palestinian Authority, its president, and its security forces. Um, however, uh, this slide is now accelerating um, under, and, 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 and essentially, uh, because of the view of these new members of the government, uh, it undermines all efforts, especially all efforts to protect and defend the occupied Palestinian population from the violence exercised by extremist uh, settlers, as happened three weeks ago in a town called Khawara, where settlers went on a rampage uh, that in my high school education, which I still remember, was called the pogrom, uh, in response to the murderous, uh, to the murderous killing uh, of two Israelis by a Palestinian terrorist. Um, I have to say in literature classes, again, that I still remember in elementary school and high school, uh, we had to read uh, the poetry of, uh, of Bialik and Chernikovsky, describing the horrific pogroms to which Jews in Eastern Europe uh, were subjected. And now an Israeli state finds itself complicit in these, in, this, in not exactly similar, this, the level of, 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 uh, of uh, massacres is, is not the same as what happened when Cossacks attacked uh, uh, Jewish shtetls in, in the diaspora, but bad enough. And if this wasn't bad enough, I would say it pales in comparison to the fact that after seven or eight uh, of the violent settlers were actually apprehended by the Israeli police, some 50 members of Knesset, 50 members of Knesset and some cabinet ministers signed a shameful petition calling for their release. The fourth issue is burden sharing. At its core is a new draft law that would exempt Haredi students in yeshivot uh, from military service. Again, this problem is not new. This problem existed from the first days of the state. But even if you look only at the last 32 years, so the, number, the, 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 the percent of males that were exempted from military service in 1992 cohort was 4%. The, the number has already reached 16.4%. And that's before this law is enacted. So, uh, and of course, what exactly will be the percentage once this law is, 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 uh, is enacted is anybody's guess. So, of course, hundreds of largely secular Israelis are now in the streets protesting. Protesting this in addition to everything else that I already mentioned. The fifth uh, dimension of the perfect storm is Israel's most important, is, has to do with Israel's most important alliance, which is with the United States and the American Jewish community. Well, finally, after the prime minister retreated a few days ago, well, 24 hours ago, uh, the American ambassador to Israel for the first time did not exclude the possibility that actually Netanyahu will get finally some invitation to the White House. But all this, now, we have to, again, make sure we don't confuse. Relationship between the Prime Minister and the President of the United States is not similar to the relations between Israel and the U.S., and especially it's not similar to the relationship between the Israeli defense community and the American defense community. 
during the height of tensions between the United States, uh, between Netanyahu in the previous incarnation and President Obama, the relations between the Israeli and American defense community became even closer and closer uh, and closer. Um, but still we have to remember that these relationships were based on the idea of common values, on the fact that, uh, that we are two liberal democracies, or at least until now we are, two nations of immigrants, two countries who fought and won liberty from, and independence from the British Empire, and in recent decades, uh, two countries who were in, in, uh, challenged by Islamic terrorism. So all of this, uh, now we've had a you know, whole list of warnings from the White House and people close to President Biden, including the invitation that until now at least wasn't issued yet. The sixth and final dimension of the perfect storm is the ever-developing Iranian nuclear threat. We are currently yet at another new phase of, this, of the development of this threat, um, with the International Atomic Energy discovering that um, at least in one facility, Iran has enriched uranium to 84%. And only last Thursday, testifying uh, to the US Congress, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, said that Iran is only two weeks away from producing enough missile material to produce a bomb, and only a few months away from producing real nuclear weapons. So even in terms of the assessments, the two countries are now very close uh, together. Iran is, we have to remember, Iran is not Iraq, and it's not Syria. It is significantly farther away. It has many more facilities than either Iraq had or Syria had, and at least one of them is dug deeply, deeply underground. If these six dimensions weren't enough, the government and its right-wing supporters poured more fuel on the fire, more rain on the perfect storm, more wind on the tsunami, and apologies for the mixed metaphors, by depicting the protesters as quote-unquote anarchists, with some, especially the prime minister's son, using much harsher language in an attempt at massive character assassination of the protesters. So, anarchists, the protesters responded by the tens of thousands in disbelief, you don't have actually an Air Force, a Navy, an Intel community, and special forces without us anarchists. But in all of this, by the way, and with this I will end, there is some very, very good news. In the short term, almost all of Israel's war ended with the adversary asking for a truce or a ceasefire. This time, the Israeli government asked the Israeli people for a truce for a ceasefire, and allowed negotiations that began today to begin. These negotiations will initially focus on only one of the many issues that comprise the perfect storm, which is the legal issue, uh, but, so what, which means that the struggle uh, is not over. But much more important are the longer-term good news. The Israeli liberal democratic center and center left that went to sleep, <coughs> if not into deep depression, following the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin, and even more so at the beginning of the, by the beginning of the second Palestinian Intifada, has now woken up big time, and there is no going back. It has finally realized that it cannot permit the committed, active, mobilized right wing to dominate the country that notwithstanding their amazing achievements as reservists who build an air force, build a navy, build an armored corps, special forces and an intelligence community second to none, they, that can defend the country, as Prime Minister Barak used to say, against any contingency, they must also be prepared to be mobilized, to, the, to be called up to do reserve service in the struggle over the character of the state, of the character of the state that they're defending, over what kind of a state they want Israel to be. In attempting to go too far in the service of an agenda far too extremist, the right wing did a great service. It woke up the Israeli center and center left. And the latter will not leave the new battlefield if there is no, and there is no going back, as I said. So the, so 
I conclude by saying textbook writers, myself included, will have to write a new chapter, uh, at, at, or at the very least, uh, of, of at, at the very least, Israel's social history. And with this, I will end. Thank you. Thank you for your optimism. I think we all uh, could use it. And uh, I should say the 14-week period you mentioned brings, reminds me that we were, Jessica, myself, our kids, and also Shai was, were in Israel all at the same time in December. And I remember coming back to Brandeis to sort of confirm um, this lecture. And I remember the email that I received from uh, Shai just days after coming back where he said, Forget about it. He said, the place has changed dramatically since you left. That's what you said, and it was literally days. Thank you so much for that really tour de force and giving all of us, uh, even those of us who have been so tied to uh, the news, watching everything day to day to give us your sense and also to illuminate so many of the issues that Israel faces. For now, though, I'd like to bring you back up here and present to you this ceremonial chair that we do here at Brandeis for endowed professors. So please come on up. And it is an engraved chair. It's an engraved chair. Yeah. Excuse me? Yes, Belinda and Alan can come up, and also Gary as well, to come up and take a picture with you. And this is a, uh, a chair that we give to our endowed professors. It's engraved with the name of the endowed professor as well. So sit down. You have to sit down. That's where you're going to be. We'll take a picture around you. It's your chair. And really, I speak on behalf of everyone here at Brandeis, and I guess I'm a relative newcomer compared to some of you, but in any case, Shai, everything you've contributed to Brandeis, we're really grateful. Congratulations. So at this point, thank you all for coming to Shai's lecture. For those of you who are joining us for dinner, uh, that dinner will be in Sherman. Uh, there are folks outside to direct uh, those who are participating in the dinner down to Sherman. And for all else, again, thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. <laughs>